As a female, we have a nature to nurture, which we've discussed through this, which is in line with working towards and ensuring our young ones have a future within a fruitful environment. And therefore, we should lead by example. As Dr. Seuss stated in the Lorax, at least, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. This podcast series, Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions, gives voice to the vital environment support and ecological sustainability work undertaken by inspiring women practitioners, advocates and thought leaders in this state. We hope that it offers our audience and particularly women listeners energising ideas and encouraging role models which can help motivate them as they develop their own contributions toward building a genuinely sustainable future in this place. To be clear, that would be a future based upon much improved levels of human and other species health and well-being, much improved levels of social fairness and an authentic, sustainable economic prosperity which leaves no one behind. The series was produced for Hope Incorporated Australia in Toowoomba, Queensland, on and adjacent to the traditional lands of the Jarawa, Guyabal, Yugara and Waka Waka peoples of the surrounding region. Hope pays respect to the past, present and emerging leaders of all First Nation Australians in this country and celebrates the unique contributions their cultures make to this place. Those contributions include Indigenous spiritual respect and care for country, the sovereignty of which was never ceded. We acclaim Indigenous stewardship of the nature of Australia, undertaken over many, many thousands of years, and the model that stewardship provides us now in this place, as we survey and attempt to repair some of the environmental damage created by the often misguided development approaches of only the last 200 years or so. Hello and welcome. My name is Andrew Nicholson and I am the producer of the podcast series. We have heard from other guests in this series about the central importance of the Land Care Initiative in protecting and enhancing the landscapes of South East Queensland over many decades. The volunteer facilitated, collaborative, cross sectoral environmental support model which Land Care helped develop is also present within Australian community catchment management initiatives. And together, these two approaches to caring for the natural world have formed a cornerstone of the effective public involvement to improve environmental quality in Queensland and the rest of Australia. My guest in this episode, Mary Lou Giptons, OAM, has a detailed experience of the workings of both land care and community catchment management in this part of Queensland, gained through 30 years of on-the-ground work at various administrative levels. In our discussion, Mary Lou taps into her extensive history of environmental protection work across landscape and catchments to offer our audience insights into the trends she has observed over the decades, what the future may hold in store for necessary work going forward in these sectors, and advice for listeners who might wish to enter some of the roles she has pursued with such determination over the years. So, a very warm welcome, Mary Lou, and I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks, Andrew. I'm sure it'll be interesting for both of us going on our past conversations. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Well, the first question, you know, starting right back at the beginning, as they say, as with all guests, we ask them, you know, how did you get into your environmental interest? So the first question is, do you remember how your passion for the natural environment started? Well, growing up in Kalamala, and actually I forgot to say a bit about this, is that um, for the first three years of my life was on the road driving, so I wasn't in confined to a house. I was very much out in the environment. And our dad gave us a sense of bush education regarding our natural environment. And then in 1989, Shane, my husband, um, was the inaugural secretary to the Brisbane Valley Kukoi Landcare Group. We both were members and served in various roles on the management committee um, until 2003 when we moved to the Downs. And then really Landcare became the fifth member of our family because we had four children previous to that. And just picking up on that point about children and and, uh, your childhood, and it's been a common theme, and I'll mention it again, that almost every guest that we've had in this series so far has talked about 
an early childhood experience in the bush, in the natural environment, in nature, um, whether that was on the land or otherwise. And and I think that is such an important point to to pick up because in a in a situation now where we have increasing numbers of children, it would seem not spending as much as much time in nature, if, if any, you know, in front of screens and all that sort of stuff. That Richard Louvre work, Last Child in the Woods, and a number of other you know academic research um, projects that have looked at this, you know, it's not uh, a good thing for young children not to have uh, you know ongoing connection with nature, and it also links to this idea that. You know, young kids who are, have been exposed to nature often go on to develop very environmentally supportive um, environmental attitudes later in life, as as you've demonstrated yourself. So that whole point about what could we do uh, about this nature deficit uh, situation with young kids, you know, not being as exposed to nature as they have in the past. But that's, you know, a subject for another podcast. But I just remark upon it there. And I know I know you have an education experience. <laughs> Well, good. I'd like you to. I'll well, please do if you, if you want to expand <laughs> on it at this point. Oh, well, uh, being a teacher and a mother and someone involved in land and farm, it is really important that we don't restrict our children. If they want to play in the mud, if they want to contextualise tactile, our life, as you said, with media that we have, the I, 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 um, we have this. TV, we have the apps, we have all of this sort of stuff, but it does not replace immersing yourself physically in an environment. And we like that. We've, we've turned plastic. So we need to get real. I mean, it's good to see there is, you know, some, in a sense, a reversion now to older ideas through the nature connectedness. And I have put links to uh, in other guest episodes, and I can put it in this one as well. The, nat- the field of nature connectedness research and, you know, strategies for how we might start to turn this around. But, yeah, yeah, very, very crucial point. Let's stay with earlier times and um, talking about, early, you know, early formative experiences in a career, profession, a vocation or calling. People often refer to other people who influence them. So the next question is, is there anyone in, in particular you remember who inspired or mentored you in your work? Well, Andrew, there are numerous people who have inspired me along the land care pathway. I suppose Jock Douglas in, and his team were partly responsible for our introduction to land care, presenting it as a tool for our business that we could utilise in the dairy industry. But Bobby Brazel from Brookstead, who is a great conservatist, and she she just... Um, mentored me without formally doing so and offered me so many opportunities to be part of the state and federal scene of land care. And I want to um, thank Bobby publicly here very much for her support over a long time of time. Then, although, Andrew, I would like to share with you that I am no way an activist, what I strive for with the support of Shane, my husband, and our four children who attended many a land care or water watch event, I towed them along and they helped and supported me, is to advocate for those on-ground volunteers out there striving for our sustainable future. It is the human factor that I advocate for, education, skilling, and well-being. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And interesting that you pointed to that earlier influential female mentor. Uh, again, not trying to sort of overemphasize this point. This is this podcast is aimed, you know, at uh, listening to women's voices. But I have heard from my other guests in the series that often when they mention uh, mentors in, and important influences, it's been largely a male field that they've drawn from. And uh, you know, hopefully, and perhaps that's changing. You know, and perhaps as I think so, Andrew. I think. Um... As a female, we have a we like to nurture, and there's something called emotional intelligence, and and whether that is <laughs> that we uh, drive that from our heart, and and you with with males, it's more of a expertise role that we learn from those people as an expertise, but how we implement what we learn is influenced by I feel a nurturing that we have as a female. Not saying that males can't nurture as well, but a female's probably more in 
inclined to do so. A lot of the project officers over the years have actually been females um, that I've worked with with land care and things like that. So it is interesting. It has been interesting as a male interviewer, you know, to to be reacquainted with, not for the first time, but to be reminded of what might be termed the soft skills, you know, the suite of soft skills that women bring to these roles. There was one previous guest that came up with this fantastic expression, weaving social fabric, which I really liked because, again, I mean, that's a stereotypical view that women weave and perhaps blokes don't weave. But, I mean, it, it doesn't necessarily follow. I mean, there are male weavers. But I just think, again, you know, um, those those particular skills, those collaborative, nurturant, uh, compassionate skills that women have, you know, bring seem to bring to the table more often, um, as you as you perhaps imply. Well, thanks for that. Let's now, you know, sort of drill down a bit more into your actual on the ground work. Um, you started to get into this field uh, from, that, you know, based on earlier childhood experience and then some mentorship along the way. And you started to get your hands on, you know, active management of the land in terms of your farming uh, experience and all that. So the question is, how did you get involved in direct ways with the ideas of environmental conservation to begin with? Well, in marrying a dairy farm, we saw the improvement to our physical assets, land and water, as a must for a sustainable business. And and whilst we're at the dairy now, we still utilise land care uh, as a tool with the business that we've got here now as a small irrigation farm. Uh, Due to the education background, I saw I had skills that could be used to widen the influence of land care within our local and regional area. I was engaged for five years as a Water Watch coordinator, which brought me into schools. As you said, I actually took children out of schools into the environment, which was really exciting for them, as much as it was me to see their enjoyment out there in the environment. The other years were mainly as volunteer, striving to educate and trigger community involvement in land care orientated programs with a team of other like-minded individuals. You know, the extension to family. The involvement led to representing farming, agriculture, farming, dairying uh, and land care on different local, regional, state and national bodies over the last 30 years. You know, just picking again up on that very last point, 30 years is obviously a long time. I mean, it's half a lifetime and uh, by some by some sort of longevity accounts anyway. I'm thinking one of the great benefits amongst many of being on the landscape, as it were, of environmental protection work over that length of time, three decades, is the sort of historical perspective it might or must give you in terms of witnessing a progression of ideas and initiatives. I mean, you've just started describing that, how you came to some of these ideas around conservation work, you know, in practical terms, you know, in terms of farming experience and all that. But I just wondered if you could give us a bit of, you know, extra perspective now, a a view from the bridge, as it were, on some of those trends you have observed in direct on the ground environmental conservation and protection work. Perhaps something along the lines of, you know, what has worked well, what has worked less well and what would need to change to make things even better. But you but you score it as you as you wish. Thanks, Andrew. Um Over the years, 30-odd, as you mentioned, I've been involved in many evolutions of the National Soil Conservation Program, which started right back in, well, here in Queensland, um, soil conservation happened in the 40s and 50s. So, But in 1989, that was that realm of land care, and that went through this National Soil Conservation Program, which then became in the 90s the National Heritage Trust when Telstra was sold off and some of those funds were held in trust for the environment. So many reports I've been involved in that reviewed or renewed or, you know, sometimes we threw the baby out with the bathwater, as they say. Other times we maintained and recognised the positive aspects of what we were reviewing. This grant process the National Heritage Trust, which is, you know, caring for our land and many different country, I should say, many different names that we're given it, has resulted in a diverse delivery and implementation of on-ground works, education and research. Although the current funding applications are becoming so complex that the average on-ground group may lack, lack capacity not only to write the application, but to deliver to the standards required. Really tough stuff. This is a threat to the long-term capacity of 
our volunteering groups. Whilst the capacity of our groups to apply for state and federal funds is reducing, I must give a shout out here. QWALK, Queensland Water and Land Care is the for, for um, the volunteer groups here in Queensland, um, do a survey every year for our members to see what's happening and also for insurance purposes. And it has come every year out on top that our local regional councils and businesses really support our groups and the, these on-ground groups. So local groups should go to their local council or and use this all or um, businesses and use this linkage to support their activities. The impulse of governance and administration of volunteering has seen some groups fold. I would like to encourage any groups in Queensland who require support in this area to contact QWALK because we offer this support. It is a, it is a peak body that can support our on-ground groups. Volunteers, be they wildlife carers, conservationists, farmers or local school children, provide strength and future for economic viability, environmental protection and the social equity of our nation. It's us to go forward. So the whole range of, of ideas that have come out of that. I just want to pick up one because I, it sort of resonates with me in terms of other areas. But this idea that, you know, for whatever reason, and we haven't got time to discuss that today, but the grant um, the grant granting process seems to be becoming more complex in terms of groups and individuals applying for funding. And what is that about? Is that about simply there doesn't seem to be as much money? There are a lot more groups chasing the same pot? I don't know. But I, I've heard this, uh, this same um, story from other sectors that are applying for grant funding, it seems to be getting harder uh, for whatever reason to get your hands on on adequate funding. But again, perhaps subject for another discussion. But staying with um, this idea of your impactful work, I mean, across that length of time, you mentioned, you know, half a dozen roles that you've fulfilled there. Um, all that fantastic work for environmental protection you've done in terms of, you know, strategic planning, leadership, advocacy, uh, this next question is probably a bit superfluous in your case because of the, the historical length of time you've been on the landscape again. But um, was there a specific moment in time or many moments, I, I would think possibly in your case, when you first realised what impact your work was having in protecting or restoring the environment? Well, due to the involvement in land care and natural resource management movement early in the scene, I actually saw... In the early stages, it was mainly land care groups that applied for fam funding and things like that. Then the development through our agribusinesses like the dairy industry, um, Ag Force, actually became more involved in the natural resource management aspect of our, our landscape. The Brisbane Valley Kilcoy Land Care Group had the capacity to employ several land care officers over the years who are still, and the, some of these are still in the either um, NRM, the Natural Resource Management Field, or water, and it's great to see their accomplishments um, and reflect how I was part of their careers. In 2003, the Brisbane Valley Kilcoy Land Care Group actually won the Queensland Land Care Community Award, so that group was very productive and, and it still is today. They've done some great things, still doing great things. The role on the physical side, if I drive through that area, when we drive through, we can see tree plantings that we did with community and led by some of our project officers and also the paintings on the stormwater drain saying, the, the, you know, this leads to a waterway. The role I played in advocacy and on work, ground work was acknowledged by the community in 2003 with an individual Queensland State Land Carers Award. Then... Really, totally much to my surprise, in 2019, I received, along with Glenis Botel, another great um, person in land care on the Downs, uh, an Order of Australia medal for the work in conservation environment over the years. So, you know, sort of there is some moments. And you don't strive for those moments. It's, it's the pathway you take and along the way hopefully you bring people with you and, and some of those people go, in front of you and then you start following and so 
it is a um, reversal of roles because you have empowered others to go forward. Yeah, it's so, look, again, there's so many ideas there. I'm just going to pick out a couple, you know, in, term, in terms of that bigger picture, some bigger picture themes that for each interview here, you know, what are some of the bigger picture themes of how our women guests have achieved the stuff they have done on the land or in, for environmental protection? I think what you're talking about here at, at one level, at a bigger picture level, is the change management process more generally. I mean, in your case, in the form of you being an influential change agent or catalyst or whatever, however term you want to use, You've encouraged, you've mentored a second generation or a next generation of workers into the field of land care, natural resource management. I mean, you were mentored yourself. You know, you have you've also fulfilled that role. And also, I'm hearing that perhaps that the psychological benefits of being able to savor past achievements, you know, for a a, a vocation well lived in a sense, um, that ability to look back on the Golden Stamp album and think, yeah, I did that. You know, I, I helped create that. You'd have said you're going around the countryside uh, driving around and you can see actual on the ground evidence of, of the, the sort of mark you've left literally so that must be very gratifying to say the least so again i think this also links into comments other guests have made about the job satisfaction or the, the satisfaction that comes out of a vocation like land care like environmental protection work generally the fulfillment that comes out of that uh, it's obviously been there in in large quantities for you Let's let's just stay with this idea of fulfillment, accomplishment. Um, talking about again that really extensive work history that you've you've outlined there. You've already mentioned some of this here, but let's go on to consider some specific accomplishments um, that you're particularly proud of, uh, environmental achievements that you're particularly satisfied with, and why. Well, Andrew, once again, I suppose I'm reverting to the Water Watch, a program that that I was part of, and it was the um, urban and rural links program and that where a school from year five students from um, from in Brisbane used to come out and and work with the Kilcoy year five children and they'd go down to a waterway and do micro um, assessments water quality and and riparian assessment around there and then it was reversed that the country children actually went into a city environment and saw a waterway in a city environment. These children were out there and, and they were, you know, sort of in around the water safely, of course, because safety is always a good thing to take in consideration. <laughs> also eating around the creek. So so they um, not only worked, enjoyed, but they also shared food around in that environment. We also sampled the Brisbane River and local creeks and I also <laughs> was asked to uh, do a display in Queen Street Mall and they made me a nice big sand pit. And this is something that I used to do at school. I used to build a catchment and then talk about um, overland flow, having vegetation, soil movement, et cetera, et cetera. And so people actually stopped and spoke with me. I read a story about um, how our waterways change and that and people were quite attentive to what I was doing. I also chaired the Queensland Water Watch Committee for a few years. My husband, Shane, also chaired that same group, and I did it uh, a few years later. But I suppose I became a member, a, a representative for South East Queensland on the Land Care Catchment Management Council, which was an advisory group, uh, group to the then Minister for Natural Resource Management. And at that time, the government actually was closing down their advisory groups and this group had been around for a while. We put forward what land care, so you can imagine it was around for about 15 years or so, and then we were told that it was closing down. Well, the group of that day and our chairman, we decided that we would like to go, we would go to the government and with a proposal that we form a group and that the government would assist our volunteers and help us and keep them safe through insurance and governance. And so I was asked to chair the steering group in 2003 that formed that, Queensland Water and Land Carers, and I also had the privilege of naming it because we couldn't call it land care, we called it water and land care so that we would be more inclusive of those on-ground groups in Queensland. So currently. We went from back then the Landcare Catchment Management Council, there was about 250 Landcare groups in Queensland, 
And now with a broader aspect of members, we have about 460 members, equating to around about 36,000 volunteers. And, and, you know, they come from land care groups to wildlife carers to community gardens, that sort of things. I currently have the honour of being the condomine headboard, a condomine, sorry, director, which is the catchment that we're in here, and I chair Queensland Water and Land Carers, and so I, that's a, I feel an achievement from a group. I, I didn't sit on that group at the beginning because I shifted catchments. I went from southeast Queensland over to the Downs, and on our farm over the past forty years. Shane and I, well, mainly Shane, has has implemented some on-ground changes to enhance our sustainability and utilisation of our land and water. So it's not just um, something outside of our lives, daily lives. It is it is something in our daily lives that we share. Again, Mary Lou, such a, a smorgasbord of stuff there. It would be impossible to, uh, you know, essentially recap everything you've said there. But just taking, again, a couple of points at random, in a sense, that struck me was you've done, you know, you've worked across the whole spectrum, everything from, and I know you do have a teaching background as well, but, you know, direct hands-on work with children, uh, educative work with children, helping them understand how to monitor the health of the physical environment in terms of catchment, you know, stream health, stuff like this. Um that ability to become, you know, good environmental stewards, you know, and monitoring of the health of the natural world is, you know, a vital skill within that. But also that idea of getting kids out there and actively involved, you know, that whole action research model of environmental education that sadly seems to have dropped off the agenda in so many areas uh, as to what that's about. Again, uh, again, we've commented in other episodes, are the school curricula just too full of other stuff these days? I, I'm not sure. It's Again, it's a, a subject for another. It's also a risk. It's, it's very high risk. Once you take the char- children out of your classroom, and, and especially if you leave the school grounds, you have to uh, make judgmental calls on your risk assessment and, and just what is involved. And also hiring a bus or something like that to transfer children to a waterway or something is a, cost, a higher cost factor than days gone by. But it is mainly this... Um, risk that we have to assess if you take children outside of their school environment. I wonder, though, again, and again, without spending too much time on this, because it's not the topic of this uh, podcast, but again, risk, who's risk, who defines the risk, you know, what's the relevance of the risk? Because the overall message that could be coming out of all of this, and I think to some extent, sadly, it has come out. I remember talking to a teacher years ago who's having problems getting an ant garden um, you know, shock, horror, deep intake of breath, an ant garden into the classroom. No, no, you can't have that because ants, well, they might have disease. They might have what? who knows what. You know, the message coming out of this is that the, the natural world is a risky place. I mean, this is the inadvertent possibility of what comes out of this. But anyway, that's another topic for another time and the bureaucrats. But it, it does link back into another a- a- aspect of your multifarious a- activities. You know, you haven't been shy of getting your hands involved in the bureau- bureaucracies in the bureaucratic roles, you've been in there at a bureaucratic level advocating for um, a continuation of good work amongst the political vagaries of what government or the political process considers to be relevant at any particular time. You've worked with that, you know, to shape it and to keep um, land care and whatever it was called at the time, those sort of activities on track. So, you know, fantastic to hear that. Okay, so... Let's now, Mary Lou, as we move through the story of your important environmental support work across the Darling Downs region, it can't all have all been a stroll in the park to try and use an, an urban nature metaphor. I mean, you've already hinted at some of the actual challenges, although you seem to have you know, mastered them uh, very, very ably indeed. But the, the question here is, what have been some of the challenges you have faced in your environmental support career journey and how have you overcome them? As a volunteer in this field, I... I, I I see myself having a vacation here rather than a career and and following a pathway sometimes is a physical and political environment that I will be working within. Uh, opportunities to be involved in land care and natural resources, events at local, regional, state and the national level have presented themselves enabling me to advocate for volunteers and on ground. And I'm probably, um, whether it's, I'm a bit of an extrovert. Um, I have had the capacity to have my say 
to bring forth um, things from what I've learned from community as a female and not to be demoted in any shape or form because I am a female. Uh, it, I was a, I, I see myself as a person first and then as a female secondary, but I and I whether presenting myself as a person first. Um, so I'll, I'm not an elbow sitter. <laughs> I will go forth and I hope I have done that. I feel the main challenge is the practicality of sustainability. To enhance our environment, what we do has to be doable and it's got to be have the longevity. It's got to be on ground and livable. And this is the difference between getting a contractor to go and plant, do a planting, which we need contractors to, it's all workable, or having a community group doing that same job but having that that emotional tie, like myself, going back through Kilcoy and seeing those trees um, that were planted, um, you know, sort of uh, having that emotional tie, you will look after that and you will pass that on to further generations because you say to them, oh, look what I did when I was this, and then they will say to their children, oh, Granny did that or Granddad did that or something like that. So there is a bit of a passing on of ownership, which I think is important for, for us as a community. Every person has an impact on the, their environment just by living. Even if you're in a flat, it doesn't matter if you've got huge landscape or you have your flat, you are still impacting on an environment. It is by educating our community how to care. Their little actions matter. And the usual, you know, we say it all the time, don't throw your rubbish out the window. Please don't, especially our country roads are just so beautiful and then you will see, and then the cities, you see it as well. So the old adage, reduce, reuse and recycle. And that's what we all can do in our own little world. Fascinating to hear some of the very practical tips that you've used your working philosophy in effect of environment environment protection work um in on a vocational basis as opposed to a career basis but nonetheless very very important work that you've done uh career vocation are terms that you know to some extent as far as the environment's concerned probably don't have a lot of significance it, it's going to appreciate the uh, protective work that people put in you know you cited there some of the, the tips and you know processes you brought to that work I know that it's brought a great deal of satisfaction and, and well-being to you. I mean, you've already talked about that, you know, observing stuff on, on your rounds, um, the pride that you take in that. Can you just expand a little bit on that? You know, in your particular case, how do you feel that your environmental protection volunteer work over the last 30 years or so has influenced your well-being, motivation and determination to keep doing what you do? As a volunteer working with others in the same area, as a team, it is a gift, just that like-mindedness. Uh, the buzz being with like-minded people working towards a common goal gives me personally strength to forge our head, striving for a balance between nature and human activity. We're here. We're here to stay, and hopefully we're all out within our environment. Being an advocate for the on-ground volunteers at a regional, state and federal level has been important to me. In no way am I a public speaker, but as a connector and networker, I, I think I have some capacity. <laughs> uh, being part of the Queensland State Land Care judging panels and, and the, the National Land Care uh, Awards of judging panel and on organising committees to do with that over the years has been a highlight as I've become more aware of the great job our volunteers are doing to protect our Queensland or even our Australian environment. Thanks for that, Mary Lou. It's very interesting to hear those comments. I think it links into the psychological research, which backs up the notion of the value of group work to achieve common goals. Also, it echoes here the potential of a wide variety of environmental protection or enhancement work to offer fulfilment and satisfaction generally. And under the current circumstances of national and global environmental decline, perhaps one of the most important job sectors that anyone could be in, whether paid, whether vocational, whether calling, 
uh, would be in environmental protection work, although it's not always properly valued by wider society. A number of other uh, guests have talked about their work within the environmental protection space and just made that point that it brings them a great deal of satisfaction knowing that they're they're helping work to you know bring the quality of life of future generations not just this one i mean both humans and non-humans but that whole thing about uh, that vocational buzz that you get from that work okay well look mary lou as we now move toward the end of this great interview uh, let's switch focus to the present moment in 2023 and the future beyond um so firstly and this is probably a silly question to ask you particularly, but are you working on any current exciting projects? Yes, but not in the physical sense, but the advocacy, education and community driven. Uh, locally with the Condomine Catcher Management Association, um, which this is my 20th year with on the management committee there. Uh, we meet quarterly and offer an opportunity for like-minded groups to come together a network at a regional level, plus we have a guest speaker and there's some educational networking aspect to that. Organising these events with the um, CCMA management team, uh, as I said, include a um, guest speaker and it gives me a sense of uh, accomplishment and commandership because we're all there together with a common cause. State level with QWALK, we'll be rolling out workshops to educate member groups on how to keep their volunteers safe and to keep themselves safe in this environment that we're in. And that's that's legality-wise, not in the wilds, but it is if, if we go out and do some other jobs there. Naturally, Together webinars are on a monthly base discussing relevant topics for our member groups and, and for anybody else publicly who would like to join that. And it's all about enhancing how we work within the Queensland environment and how we can enhance our Queensland environment as well. Mary Lou, I just want to take another opportunity here. You know, it's a bit of a barrow of mine, as you probably gather, but the value of envir environmental education, environmental support education generally um, for both adult community members, but especially for the younger generations who are going to follow us. Yes. Sadly, in my view anyway, the importance of environmental education within the formal school sector seems to have increasingly taken a back seat over the last 25 years or more. But it's great to see that land care and catchment management bodies such as you've described have stepped into that space to some extent and, and for the adult communities that you work with as well. And, and just to make a point, if anyone's out there, any sort of teachers or educators of young kid, younger kids, high quality environmental education resources for school age learners are available for download from the cool australia website we'll put a, a link into that and I, I haven't i haven't looked at cool australia for a number of years and it really seems to have expanded its remit fantastically you know across a whole range of not just physical environmental stuff but you know uh, cultural and so, social issues stuff as well andrew lancare australia have um teacher uh is a th um sorry things there that they can use within the classroom as well and you've got to remember that in a lot of um, education um, regions, there's usually a environmental school where they can take children to, for excursions and things. That's great to hear. And, and again, as with all, all these episodes in the show notes, let's put some links in there. I know you're going to supply me with a few links. So let's, if, if there are links to, to the sort of resources you just mentioned, uh, have a look in the show notes, folks, out there in podcast land, and uh, you will be taken to the resources. So now, finally, Mary Lou, a last couple of questions for you in this great interview um, to help round off the commentary for listeners. The first one is uh, that classic, you know, first and last um, part of a presentation. Could you give us a short comment as an audience take home message, which helps summarize what you've been talking about today? Well, Andrew, over the years, you know, you could look at many things. And one was a poem. It's a Chinese poem of long standing. And it says, if you are thinking a year ahead, sow a seed. If you are thinking 10 years ahead, plant a tree. If you're trying 100 years ahead, educate people. By sowing a seed once, you will harvest once. By sowing a tree, you will harvest tenfold. By educating people, you will harvest 100fold. And the simplistic of that statement stands today. If we educate people, if we educate our children 
for life skills as well as academia, they will produce within themselves a harmony and able to look after themselves. The other is from um, a man in Thompson who worked for the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestries and worked on the 2011-2012, one of these reviews, Caring for Our Country Program and Land Care Review. And he stated that governance, governments at least come and go. Regional bodies will come and go, but the community will always be there. This is the subsidiary, new word for me, is about that it is our on ground and we go forwards. So education and community are our strengths in this field now and into the future. So my advice is of a general nature, being part of a team um, enhances individuals' capacity to make a difference and small steps make way for larger accomplishments. Be true to yourself and those around you as this will maintain energy and focus of what you're doing. It doesn't have to be an issue who could strive for the maintenance improvements. It can be, you know, we think of um, we have environmental concerns, but we can have environmental aspects that we want to advance, that we want to increase. Um, we don't have to be issue driven. We can look at our positiveness in our society and build upon that. Each of us have a role in our everyday life to practice what we believe and therefore we should lead by example, not only for our immediate family, but generally. It doesn't mean that that just because no one is looking that we don't do the right thing and, and that's like equating to taking the trolley back after you've used it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. I think I skipped the question. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you, you it leaded. You, you, you've brought two together. That's great, Mary Lou. Such a rich spectrum of ideas to pick from there. I really love going to that first part, that first question um, about um, comments and and uh, a summary of your of the, what you've been talking about. The philosophical reflection on the value of education generally but also particularly as regards the natural world, education about nature, the natural world, the environment, because the natural world and, and the physical environment operates on cycles of decades, centuries and millennia. It doesn't, it doesn't operate on the uh, four-year cycle or three-year cycle of the political process. So, so, so valuable to hear that long-term uh, valuation of education for, for the long-term, educating for the long-term, because that's the way the natural world operates. And I think also um, your fantastic advice for women listeners and a generic audience, but, you know, particularly for women, teamwork, taking small steps toward achieving a, a bigger picture, um, vision, being true to your values, uh, the important stewardship contribution that we can all make to help protect the environment. What a set, a great set of advice points to end this fantastic interview. So, Mary Lou, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk with you today. I know you will have given our audience some thought-provoking ideas which can help inform their own thinking about their possible next steps toward building a genuine, ecologically sustainable future in this place. Perhaps in the first instance, by starting their own conversations on the environment protection topics we've mentioned with their friends, families, colleagues within employing organisations or in their professional associations. But for now, Mary Lou, on behalf of my podcast support organisation, Householders Options to Protect the Environment, I want to thank you so much for our conversation today. Andrew, I would like to thank you and Hope and especially um, the work that is done in this and the funding from the Queensland Office of Women for the opportunity to be part of the project called Acknowledge and Celebrate the Contribution that Women of the Darling Downs have made and are making to protecting and conserve our environment project. This is a collection of stories at, at, at a point in time uh, that document women in the environment movement. As a female, we have a nature to nurture, which we've discussed through this, which is in line with working towards and ensuring our young ones have a future within 
a fruitful environment. The project captures a moment of time, as I've stated, who are willing to advocate for our environment in many different ways. I thank them also for giving their time, not only in relation to this project, but in for future endeavours as they show the way for others. As Dr Seuss stated in the Lorax at least, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And on that note, Andrew, thank you very much. I've appreciated this and thank you, Frank, as well, for all your work and the committee that is behind this. Thank you. Mary Lou, what a brilliant final reflection. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed. You've been listening to a podcast episode in the series Queensland Women, Inspiring Stories from Environmental Champions. The series was produced for Householders Options to Protect the Environment Incorporated as part of the Queensland Women's Week 2023 event and it aligns with the objectives of the Queensland Women's Strategy 2022-2027. Hope thanks the Queensland Department of Justice and Attorney General's Office for Women and Violence Prevention for the generous funding support which made this podcast project possible. Please consult the episode text notes for possible follow-up material on topics discussed and any relevant contact details should you wish to respond to anything you've heard. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider promoting it across your networks and giving it a positive rating in your preferred podcast app. My name is Andrew Nicholson, producer of the series, and thank you for listening.